So at the top there, highlighted in red, you can see there is a short video from the Britannica website. So take a look at that before we read down through the notes. Um, it's a nice introduction to Leonardo da Vinci and will just reinforce the facts, hopefully. Um, Leonardo da Vinci was born in Vinci near Florence in 1452. He was the son of a rich notary lawyer and a peasant woman. From an early age, he showed a great interest in drawing and sketching, and he was to become important in relation to the Renaissance and also became known as the Renaissance man, the symbol of the Renaissance as we know him today. He may have traveled from Vinci to Florence, where his father worked for several powerful families, including the Medicis. At the age of 17, he was reportedly apprentice to the Florentine artist Verrocchio, who we now know also worked for the Medicis. Here, Leonardo gained an appreciation for the achievement of Giotto and Masaccio. So the learning of the early Renaissance, Leonardo would have gained an, um, gleaned a knowledge of these and built on that knowledge to develop his own style. You can see here there's two images here. There's a painting of Verrocchio's. It's called The Baptism of Christ. And it's believed that Leonardo da Vinci painted one of the two angels that you can see there in a close-up. Again, there's a please watch this YouTube video on that. You can see I have it highlighted there. It's a Khan Academy, I think, or Smart History, and it's an excellent, it shows you exactly the difference between how we can spot which of the angels is Leonardo da Vinci's and which ones, which the rest of the painting is Verrocchio's. As a result of his family ties, Leonardo benefited when Lorenzo de Medici, who ruled Florence, when he when he ruled Florence, Leonardo benefited from that because he was commissioned. By 1478, Leonardo was completely independent of his tutor Verrocchio and may have then met the exiled Lodvico Sorfosa, who was a Duke of Milan. He would eventually go on to become a patron of Leonardo da Vinci's. Leonardo Ludovico sought, sought to transform Milan into a centre of humanist learning to rival Florence because up until this point there was always rivalry between Florence and Milan and particularly in the arts. He would become a great patron of Leonardo da Vinci so that's the Duke of Milan Sforza. We'll mention him a good few times as we go through this. Leonardo flourished in the intellectual environment of the Renaissance. He opened a studio received numerous commissions, instructed students, and began to systematically record his scientific and artistic investigations in a series of notebooks. Now, there, there's something like 2,500 of these notebooks. There is an enormous amount of them. A lot of them, interestingly enough, are in the British Museum. Um, and there's a bit of controversy over that. The Italians would like them back, the British, are holding on to them, but that's uh, another story. There was recently an exhibition in London, actually, of uh, Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks. Leonardo was an unrivaled painter, an accomplished architect, an engineer, a cartographer, who somebody who makes maps, and a scientist. He was particularly interested in biology and physics. Initially, he worked and trained in Florence for the Medici family, and then moved to Milan to the Duke of Sorfoso. Sorfosa. Um, but he spent the last years of his life in Rome and then his last number of years in a place called Ambois in France, where he was a, a good friend of the King of France at the time. He is died and he is buried in Ambois. Leonardo's passion was as a designer, funnily enough, rather than a painter. While he's, we, we instantly think of him as, um, he's famous now for his paintings, the Mona Lisa, the Last Supper, all of that. It wasn't his first love. He wanted to be a designer. He really painted, I suppose, to finance his time that he spent on his um, designs and industrial designs even. He designed numerous mechanical devices for battle, including a submarine and even experimented with designs for flight. Details of these designs are to be found in all of his notebooks and his sketchbooks. At the top of this page we have uh, the definition of the word Renaissance man. 
And it's a term that's often used when speaking about Leonardo da Vinci in particular. And just the definition is, a Renaissance man is a man who has a broad intellectual interest and is accomplished in areas of both the arts and science. And there's no doubt that Leonardo da Vinci was accomplished in, in many, many different things in different areas. So there's three images on this slide and they are all taken from his Leonardo da Vinci's sketchbooks. Um, and they're to do with the, the top two are to do with anatomy and biology. And you can see that and there's arms and bones and he used to dissect human bodies, which would have been totally illegal at the time, um, in order to see what was underneath the skin, to see how things worked. He had a, an unusual curiosity about everything. The bottom image there from one of his sketchbooks is for uh, different types of armory, armed machinery, uh, tanks and uh, guns and cannons and that type of thing. And bear in mind, this was thousands of years before uh, any of this was really invented. Um, if you ever have the opportunity to be in Ambois, where he spent his last years and is buried, they have a great museum there based on his inventions. And all of these things that you see in the sketch down there, the different armed machinery and equipment is built to scale and you can view them and you can go into them and they're quite amazing. So let me just read through this now. Leonardo is arguably the greatest draftsman in Western history. He was technically superb in whatever medium he used. Driven by his scientific curiosity, he studied the world around him in minute detail, making botanical and anatomical studies. This, this page is one of a number of sheets of drawings by Leonardo da Vinci in which he designed instruments of war. He drew them while working for Ludvico Sforzo, the Duke of Milan. Under each drawing in ink and brown wash, Leonardo has written words of explanation in his char characteristics mirror writing. Leonardo's fertile imagination and scientific knowledge are here combined in this creation of war machines for his warlike patron. It is highly unlikely, however, that any of these machines were ever made are used in contemporary warfare. The first two paintings of Leonardo da Vinci that we're going to look at are both very, or almost identical, both of the same subject matters, and both have the same name. And the name is the Virgin of the Rocks, sometimes known as the Madonna of the Rocks. Um, both paintings are identical. Please watch the Khan Academy video that I have put the link there on the top of the page in red. It gives a good explanation as to why we think Leonardo da Vinci painted exactly the same, almost exactly the same, um, subject matter, composition and general paintings, um, why he did this twice. The Virgin of the Rocks, sometimes known as the Madonna of the Rocks, is the name used both of Leonardo da Vinci's paintings, both of the same subject matter and very little difference in the composition except for a couple of significant details. One painting usually hangs in the Louvre in Paris and the other one hangs in the National Gallery in London. Both paintings show the Madonna and Christ child with the infant John the Baptist and an angel. In a rock, they're all set, all sitting on the ground in a rocky setting, which gives the, the painting its unusual name. The significant differences between the two paintings are in the gaze and in the right hand of the angel. There's a slight difference between the two, as you will see. There are many minor ways in the way the works differ, including the colours and the lighting some of the flowers, the flora, and the way in which the Sifumato has been used. Although the date of an associated commission is documented, the complete histories of the two paintings are unknown really, and lead to speculation as to which of the two is earlier. So really what they're saying is they're 
we don't know. We don't know which one came earlier, but we're assuming that the presumption is, and there's document documentation regarding the commission of the paintings, which lead um, the experts to believe that the painting in the Louvre, the one on the left, is earlier than the painting in the National Gallery. At the top of this page, we have a um, definition of the technique suffumato, and it means the blurred outline and mellowed colours that allow one form to merge with another, leaving something to the imagination. There are no sharp outlines. It's all one blends very softly and gently into the other. And just in case I didn't mention it earlier, I just want you to know that both paintings are tempera paint on wood panel, if you were asked about materials. The subject matter. Normally, when we see Mary and the Christ child, she's portrayed as a queen of heaven, surrounded by goals, angels, and would very often have a prominent halo. The halo's gone now here. Leonardo was one of the first to... Um, start to portray Mary and Christ and other iconic religious figures without a halo. Um, here, in contrast, we see Mary seated on the ground. This type of representation of Mary is often referred to as the Madonna of Humility. Mary has her right hand around the infant Saint John the Baptist, who's making a gesture of prayer to the Christ child. The Christ child, in turn, has his hand raised in blessing Saint John. Mary's left hand, uh, great use of the technique of foreshortening, is hovers protectedly over the head of her son while an angel looks out and points to Saint John. The figures are all located in a fabulous and mystical landscape with rivers that seem to lead nowhere and bizarre rock formations that recall the Dolmite mountains of northeastern Italy. The background nobody has no historians have ever been able to say where exactly the background is they think like i've said there a minute ago it's some sort of a mystical place that was from leonardo da vinci's imagination in the foreground we see carefully observed and precisely rendered plants and flowers the scene is based on a popular legend about saint john the baptist we immediately notice Mary's ideal beauty and the graceful way in which she moves. The figure is typical of the High Renaissance. She's in quite an elaborate pose as well. Um, what is important and needs to be mentioned about this picture is what, it's what we call a unified composition. Again, typical technique of composition used in the High Renaissance period. So a unified composition means that Leonardo grouped his figures together. They're all connected. One is touching, the other one is looking down. Our eye um, flows from one figure to the other because there's, there's a connection between all of them. Leonardo grouped the figures within a geometric shape of a pyramid. Now, I say pyramid instead of a triangle because it has depth. Um, it has three dimensions as opposed to two. He also has the figures gesturing and looking and interacting with each other. Both of these innovations serve to fully unify the composition. And a unified composition was a new thing. It wasn't there in the early Renaissance. And we have this picture down below again, which we looked at before. Uh, when we looked at it the last time, it was to observe the painting of Leonardo's angel. But for now, I'm making reference to it because it's, it's by Frau Lippi. But there's nothing unified about this composition. All the characters are placed there together one by one, but they almost have no connection to each other, the likes if they're all painted in isolation. So that would be a non-unified composition. Um, sorry, it's actually not for Olipi, it's for Rocchio's painting of the baptism of Christ. This is an important difference in the painting of the early Renaissance, where the figures often looked more separate more separated from one another. The artist of the early Renaissance had not acquired the skills to create these complified, these complex unified compositions. So yes, as I said here, down the bottom part left is Verrocchio's painting of the Baptism of Christ. Techniques artists were just learning to do in the early Renaissance like contrapposto were now very easy for the artists like Leonardo da Vinci 
and Michelangelo because they had acquired this skill from the learning of the artists that came in the early Renaissance. We have another video link here at the top um, which compares both paintings so make sure you take a look at that. It's on YouTube and you can follow the link. Now if you were discussing the style, Leonardo da Vinci's style when he painted the Virgin of the Rocks, you need to mention that this is the first time that an Italian Renaissance artist has completely abandoned the halos. Uh, Frau Filippo Lippi reduced the halo to a narrow ring around Mary's head so he was another artist of the time and he kind of rather than the large gold disc type halos we were used to seeing from the medieval times and even in Giotto's work uh, Lippi reduced it he kind of made the halo a bit smaller um, but Leonardo da Vinci just took the bull by the horns basically and got rid of the halos completely. Clearly the unre unreal, symbolic nature of the halo was not in keeping with the realism of the Renaissance and so Leonardo da Vinci didn't believe in it. It was in a way a necessary holdover from the Middle Ages because they didn't know at the time how else to indicate that this was the main divine holy figure. But Leonardo da Vinci found another way to indicate divinity or holiness by giving the figures ideal beauty and grace it became obvious we were looking at a mystical vision of Mary, Christ, John the Baptist and an angel in heaven. So he didn't need the halos anymore. What they're saying there is that by looking at the, the characters and the way in which Leonardo had painted them, that it was obvious from his techniques that these were no ordinary family out for a picnic, that they were godlike, otherworldly people. Uh, symbolism. There's quite a lot of symbolism. Apparently, they, they say there's quite a lot of symbolism in this painting. There is also a lot of symbolism in this painting. The water, the pearls, and the crystals used to fasten Mary's cloak may be taken as symbols of her purity. The chapel that this painting was intended for, the, the commissioned, was dedicated to the Immaculate Conception. The Mother of God was seen as the rock untouched by human hands. The rocks of the grotto, the grotto might therefore be a metaphor for Mary alluding to her unexpected fertility. It also could be read as a safe refuge for the infant John and the baby Jesus. The symbol of protection can be seen where Mary's hand and robes envelop St. John along with the rocky background as a safe haven. The surrounding landscape seems to shelter the figures in the foreground. The road of St. John in the painting is unusual. A meeting between John and Christ as children is rarely seen, is rarely captured in art. There is no record in the Bible of John and Jesus ever having a meeting at a young age. In the books of the Apocalypse, there is an account of Mary and Jesus meeting John in the wilderness during their flight into Egypt. It is possible that this composition refers to that account in the Bible. Uh, so that's that on the Virgin of the Rocks. Now I have put in an exam question here, 2015. There was an exam question on Leonardo da Vinci and the High Renaissance. And I'll just read it briefly. Leonardo da Vinci, study of science and nature, as well as his acute powers of observation, led him to create some of the greatest works of the Renaissance. Discuss this statement with reference to the painting illustrated on the accompanying sheet. And in that, in this case, it was the painting of the Madonna or the Virgin of the Rocks. In your answer, refer to the name of the work, subject matter, composition, technique, and the period in which the work was produced. And there's a the breakdown there for the marking scheme. So you can go ahead and answer this question if you want to, um, or you can wait until we are going to move on next to the Last Supper, and then we will be moving on to... Uh, the Mona Lisa and the, the portraits, um, Leonardo da Vinci's portraits. But uh, we will be coming back to you answering this question at some point.